For more information on tutoring, personalized video solutions, or how to support MOOF University and the production of more videos, check out MOOFUniversity.com. Thank you and enjoy. So first up, as far as the periodic trends go, is atomic size or atomic radius, which is how we measure atomic size. Before, we mentioned that electrons in an atom can be infinitely far away from the nucleus. So what we en ended up saying was that atoms were taken to be spheres where the electrons spend 90% of their time. That way we can at least imagine an atom to be sort of a ball with a surface. Okay. So how do we define atomic size when it comes to measuring it? Well, we base an atom's size on how closely it associates with another atom of the same element. And this is going to be different for metals versus nonmetals. So we'll start off with metals over here with two aluminum atoms, because aluminum, of course, is a metal. So aluminum being a metal atom, well, metal atoms just in general, when they orient themselves together, they, they, they form what's called a crystal lattice. Okay, And in these crystal lattices, we basically have the atoms sort of surface to surface. All right, we can kind of see that here. Each sphere's surface is kind of, they're just, just up against each other like this. And so what we do to measure the, the, the radius between these two, two metal atoms, um, we take the distance from one nucleus to the other nucleus. So here's a nucleus, here's a nucleus. We take the distance between them. And in this case, for aluminum, the distance is actually 286 picometers. And so what we do with that distance is we take half of it because half of it would be the distance from here to here, right? And so that is the radius of this atom. And in this case, it would just be 286 divided by two, which is 143 picometers. And so this is specifically the metallic radius. Okay. Metallic radius. The metallic radius is defined as half the distance between the nuclei of adjacent atoms in a crystal of that metal element. So here we have a crystal of aluminum. It's not, I haven't drawn the whole thing. I'm just drawing two atoms as part of it, but it's half the distance between the nuclei. Okay. So next up is nonmetals. Nonmetals, and for this we're going to use two chlorine atoms. Now, chlorine is actually a diatomic element, which means that its elemental form is Cl2. There's two atoms that make up the elemental form of chlorine. That's how it exists naturally. Okay, so it is a diatomic element, and it's really useful because what we can do is these are two of the same atom bound together, okay? And um, they're, they're a little bit different. It's different than the metallic radius in that instead of being surface to surface, there is some overlap. There's some overlap. And we can see that overlap right here, right? We can see how they're kind of overlapping a little bit. They're not surface to surface. But the principle is pretty much the same in terms of how we measure the radius. We take the distance from one nucleus to the other. And in this case, that distance, in the case of chlorine, is 199 picometers. And so half that is 99.5 or approximately 100 picometers. Now, that that's going to be the atomic radius of chlorine. And since it's a nonmetal, we're going to call this the covalent radius, which might ring a bell if you know about covalent bonding. So the covalent radius is defined as half the distance between nuclei of identical atoms that are covalently bonded. Okay, and that's the case here. Okay, now that's, that's particularly useful because if we measure the atomic radius of a nonmetal um, in its diatomic form, and that same atom binds or to, to a different atom, 
then we can use the fact that we know this atomic radius to find out the atomic radius of the other atom. So over here to the right, I've got one carbon atom bound to one chlorine atom. So here, this little gray guy right here is carbon, a carbon atom, okay? And the green, of course, is the chlorine, the chlorine atom. So same idea, we measure the distance between the two nuclei, nucleus there, nucleus there, we measure the distance between them. And in this case, it's 177 picometers. Well, we know that the chlorine basically provides 100 picometers of that because of this right here, right? We know that the the length is this this length right here is 100 picometers. So the rest of it, the rest of that 177 must be due to carbon's atomic radius. So if we have 177 picometers and we subtract 100 picometers, we're left with 77 picometers and that is the atomic radius of carbon in this case. Now one thing to pay attention to is that, or to keep in mind at least, is that atoms don't have solid surfaces, they have electron clouds. And because of this, atoms bond differently from compound to compound, okay? So the, the length of the, the, the distance or the distance between the two nuclei is not always gonna be the same. So the atomic size or radius depends on the substance in question, which is kind of weird, okay? But now that we've defined atomic radius, uh, we could basically just say that the bigger the radius, the bigger the atom, right? So next up is kind of what's going on with the trend. Okay, so what's the trend for atomic size or atomic radius on the periodic table? Well, it increases down and to the left. Okay, so we see that here on the periodic table. It's gonna, as we go to the, the left, the atomic radius will increase, and as we go down, it'll increase. So at the bottom left of the periodic table, we have the largest atoms. And at the top right, we have the smallest atoms. So now the question is, why is this? Well, it's due to shielding, electron shielding. Also, you can think about that as changes in the principal quantum number. N. And also, uh, effective nuclear charge. Effective nuclear charge, often just abbreviated as ZEFF, okay? So as the principal quantum number N increases, the likelihood that the outer electrons will be further away from the nucleus increases. Right, as you increase the the, the number uh, n, you're going up in, in you're adding more shells of electrons, so the electrons are more likely to be further away. So as n increases, atomic size or atomic radius increases as well. Okay, so we can imagine an atom here. We got two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. Um, if it, this is this is shown here as uh, sort of a um, 1s2, right? This would be uh, a helium atom, okay? Now, if I just added another shell, right? If I went to the second energy level, I would have more electrons, right? They would occupy that next shell, right? So as the n increases, what ends up happening is that we have that other shell, right? And we also have these inner these inner electrons right here, sort of shielding the outer electrons because they repel. And so there's an increase in shielding there, pushing those electrons out a little bit further. And so the atomic size will increase. Okay. Now this concept of principal quantum number and shielding, this dominates when you're thinking about the trend up and down. So this dominates down a group. So if I ask the question of 
which is bigger, sodium or potassium, which has the larger atomic radius between sodium and potassium? Well, if you look on the periodic table, you'll see that sodium is somewhere over here and potassium is right below it. So potassium being right below it should be bigger. So potassium is bigger. Okay. Now, what about across the periodic table? Well, as the effective nuclear charge, right, the positive charge in electron feels, as that increases, the outer electrons are drawn closer to the nucleus. They're pulled in closer. So as the effective nuclear charge increases, atomic size or atomic radius decreases. So a little bit of a visual for that. If we think about a situation where we have just two protons in the center, I mean, this is, don't assume that this is an actual atom, but we have two protons in here uh, in the nucleus and we have four electrons, okay? So these, these two protons right here are pulling on all these electrons, right? Because these opposite charges attract. So let's say that we added another proton, right? So now we have three protons and we, and we, um, we also add one electron. Okay. What ends up happening is that because we have more positive charge in the, in the nucleus that increases the, the actual nuclear charge. And it also increases the effective nuclear charge. The, the charge that these electrons out here actually feel is greater. And so they're pulled in towards the nucleus even closer. So we go from a situation where we have um, a larger atom to a smaller atom. Okay. So as effective nuclear charge increases, as the charge that these electrons outside of the nucleus um, experience is, is greater, then the atomic size will decrease. Now, this dominates across a period. Okay. If you notice, as you go across a period, the atomic number increases. You have more protons. And so more protons, higher effective nuclear charge. Okay. Now, um, the reason why this dominates across a period, because you're probably thinking, well, you're also increasing the number of electrons as you go from element to element across the, uh, across the period. And that's true. But because you're in the same shell, because in each period you're in the same shell, there's a super small change, um, in, in the, um, in the shielding. Okay. Because you're not adding an entirely new shell, but when you're going down a group, you're going from energy level number one, two, three, four, five, six, you're adding a new shell. So shielding dominates going down a group, but across a group, if you're in the same shell, it's, it's the effective nuclear charge that you'll be considering. So if we want to rank fluorine, barium, silicon, and gallium from largest to smallest, well, if we're going from largest to smallest, we want to go from basically the bottom left to the upper right. Okay. So I'm going to erase this portion here. Well, barium is down over here, and then uh, we've got gallium somewhere over here, and silicon is somewhere over here, and fluorine is up in the top right. So this guy, barium, is going to be the biggest, then gallium, then silicon, and then fluorine. Okay. So I'm going to put barium is the largest, then gallium, then silicon, and fluorine. Okay. So I hope that makes sense and I hope that was a helpful video. Thanks for watching. If you found that video helpful, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share with friends. Thank you and happy studying.